The Rich Life, 10 Investments for True Wealth, written by Bo Henderson, narrated by Kevin Clay. Investment number one, practice wise stewardship. The foolish man seeks happiness in the distance. The wise grows it under his feet. James Oppenheim, American poet and novelist, 1882 to 1932. Taking Responsibility Money is an inside job, as are all things involving wealth. No matter what the asset, it had its beginnings as a thought inside you, an idea, or a desire. The desire to have a life partner. The thought that you would look mighty fine in that suit. The idea that if you can sell X amount of Y, you will have the mortgage paid. It's the thought process that generates anything and everything we see in the material world. And so, in order to change the way money and assets come and go, we need to change the way we think about them. The first step in this process involves the practice of wise stewardship. However, stewardship is a term that isn't heard much these days. I admit the word sounds a little outdated. The concept is not only timeless, but wise, closely related to responsibility, a life based on stewardship, or more specifically, on taking responsibility, is one of the core principles necessary for building a rich life. It puts the ball fully in your court, but it's important to understand the difference between being responsible and being at fault. Blame implies fault. Responsibility implies ownership. Blame is stagnant. Responsibility propels you forward and onward to your greater good. Sherry Carter Scott, Ph.D., author of If Life is a Game, These Are the Rules. What I'm talking about is taking responsibility for where you are right now with regard to those assets that have been entrusted to you. Now, this will either come to you as good news or bad, depending on your nature. If the inner child in you balks at the thought of responsibility, consider for a moment the fable of the goose and the golden egg. If you have a goose that lays golden eggs, you're not going to starve it or let it run amuck through town, or even worse, cook it. Even a child can see the error in that. You're going to tend to your goose with care because she can produce for you great wealth. In taking care of your goose, you become a steward. Stewardship can be defined as the behavior of an accountable person. Its root word is keeper, meaning one who cares for and manages people and things. The careful management of that which has been given to us pertains to many facets of life, not just money, but changing the way we treat those assets, including the way we treat money, can result in a drastic and life-changing shift. It comes down to one important distinction. Do we view our talents and physical possessions as something we own and are entitled to? Or as special gifts that have been entrusted to our keeping? Le Jardin Marguerite worked as a hostess for a small but high-end French restaurant owned by a husband and wife team. Because of the way they ran the register, Marguerite was not only in charge of seating the customers, but also of processing every guest check, be it credit card, gift certificate, or cash. The staff at Le Jardin was highly professional. Most of the waiters, career servers who had been in the industry their entire adult lives. They earned respectable incomes, upwards of 60K annually, working most nights, every weekend, and all major holidays. Each had their different styles of service, but there was one server who consistently out-earned them all. On a typical night, we find Anton beginning his shift by checking each place setting. He polishes the stemware and knives. He makes sure all the settings are intact. Meanwhile, his co-worker Fernando begins his night by looking through the reservation books. Fernando notices that a table of ten is due to arrive at six o'clock. He immediately begins strategizing ways to ensure that he will get to wait on them. He talks to Marguerite about it, 
then to the busboy and the bartender. He talks with the owners to find out who they are. They're celebrating a retirement, Fernando is told, and he turns that information over in his mind. Meanwhile, the first table arrives, a party of four, and Marguerite seats them in Anton's section. He is ready and greets them, his focus on taking them through a pleasant evening. Another table arrives, this one a party of two, who is seated for Fernando, and then another four-top arrives for Anton. Now, Fernando is irritated, because Anton has two four-tops while he only has a deuce. This directly affects his income, because more people order more food, which results in a larger bill and a bigger tip. As a new table comes in, a party of two for Fernando, he approaches the hostess stand fuming. I'm not waiting on another deuce, he tells Marguerite. You're killing me. But I thought you wanted the tin top, she replies. I'm just trying to keep the number of covers even. Fernando runs through a quick mathematical calculation. He looks again at the reservation book and tallies the number of guests still due to arrive. He considers that the ten is a retirement party and pictures a bunch of gray heads huddled over coffee with split entrees. Meanwhile, the tables in his section wait patiently. The busboy brings them water, but they haven't ordered drinks. Anton goes by with a steaming platter of appetizers and the aroma fills the restaurant. Fine, says Fernando. Let Anton have the ten top. Just make sure that I get the six top and the next two parties of four. So you don't want to take the deuce? Marguerite asks. A nicely dressed party of four has just arrived, and Fernando replies that he will take them instead, and passes Anton the two-top. Within the next ten minutes, another party of four arrives, as well as the six-top Marguerite promised to Fernando. She tries to talk to him, but now he is frantic, trying to take care of too much at once. How about I let Anton have this other four so you can focus on your six, she asks. But Fernando says he can handle it. In his mind, he is still working the numbers. At six o'clock, the party of ten arrives, and they are only going to be eight because one couple had to cancel. They are seated with Anton as agreed, and Fernando takes note of their age and attire. He feels good about his decision, until he notices the kind of wine they order. Opus One, at four hundred dollars a bottle. Fernando does some more mental math and starts fuming again. He complains to Marguerite, to the bartender, to the owners. He forgets to check back with his table of six, and so they have to flag down the bus boy, who then tells Marguerite, who tells the bartender, who tells Fernando, that they would like to order another bottle of wine. But by the time Fernando gets back to them, it's too late, and they've changed their mind. By the end of the night, Marguerite says, both servers had waited on exactly the same number of people, but Anton had somehow managed to earn nearly twice the amount of money. And that small party of two Fernando passed off at the beginning of the night? They were really nice and left Anton a huge tip. She smiles. It's like that almost every night. Fernando is a great guy. He can talk to anybody about anything, but he's always worried about who's getting what instead of just taking care of what he already has. The Scarcity Mentality The difference between Fernando and Anton boils down to the way they view their assets. Fernando felt he was entitled to the guests at his tables, whereas Anton viewed himself as their keeper. Anton wanted to make sure his guests had a pleasant evening, whereas Fernando wanted to ensure a positive outcome for himself. Going back to our goose with the golden egg, it's the bird in the hand that counts. There is nothing more important than the person in front of you and nothing else you should be doing but tending to them. The world has been telling us since we were kids to always think ahead, watch out for number one, and be the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. Not only do we believe these things, but we behave accordingly. 
ironically, thinking only of ourselves and not others, has the unintended effect of pushing away the success we desire, as demonstrated by Fernando and his inattentive service. When we come from a place of entitlement, we have a sense of being better or separate from that which we own or serve. If we go further into that, this sense of entitlement has at its core an underlying sense of unease. At the root of that unease is fear. Fear that what is owed to us will be taken away, turned against us, or that someone less deserving will get it if we don't. When we apply this to our assets, and more specifically, our money, we adopt a scarcity mentality. Ninety percent of the people in the world view their assets in this way. It is the sum total of what we have been told since we were children. There is not enough. Get it while you can. If you don't, someone else will. Money doesn't grow on trees, and so on and so forth. If you are nodding your head in agreement, as I once did, chances are you have adopted this mentality. Once you become aware of this, you can begin to make the shift to another way of looking at your assets, physical, financial, and human. You can become their keeper. Adopt a grateful attitude toward who or what they are and what they are able to provide, and in so doing, you will increase their productivity and your wealth. Let's look at that statement carefully because chances are you won't be able to agree with it right away, let alone practice it. If you have credit card debt and receive a check that will barely cover your rent, you'll not likely be inclined to jump up and down for joy at your great good fortune. Instead, you're going to be thinking, it's not enough. I don't have enough. In the case of Anton and Fernando, if you're watching a co-worker get what looks to you like more than their share, feelings of entitlement and resentment are going to come up. So how can you reverse this? How can you be grateful for what you have when from your point of view, what you have is not enough? As it applies to your assets, here is the secret. The quickest way to attract more of something in your life is to appreciate what you already have. Regardless of how little or how much, be a good steward to your assets and they will multiply. Believe it or not, the laws of physics can't help but give you more. Think again about that goose who lays her shiny prize. Who will give you the biggest, most golden eggs? The bird who is loved and cared for or the one who is feared and ignored? Why Good Stewardship Gives Good Return on Your Investment I have more good news for you. The better stewards we are with what has been given to us, the higher the quality and more frequent the gifts become. That's right. Being a good steward will always give you a good return on your investment. Now, this isn't magical or mystical or advanced economics. This happens for three practical reasons. First, if one does nothing to care for material possessions, they are subject to the elements to stagnation and to general disrepair. Like an engine that never gets an oil change, the life of those possessions is significantly shortened. Second, there's something wonderful that happens when you demonstrate good stewardship to others. It's called the law of reciprocity. And according to psychologist Robert Cialdini in his book, The Psychology of Persuasion, it comes into play a majority of the time. The law of reciprocity states that if you are willing to give first, most people will be inclined to return your kindness in goods, deeds, or favors, regardless of your expectations, and for best results, you should have none. In other words, take care of the people around you, and the conditions become favorable that they will take care of you. In other words, more golden eggs. Third, when we respond according to the scarcity mentality, we tend to hoard, to tighten our fist, and in so doing, we close ourselves off to anything good that might come our way. Even if an opportunity does arrive, we say no. We cannot see it for what it is, because we are too concerned with getting through the month with enough money to make it. Like a sealed-off house, 
no sun gets through our windows, and no good news comes through our door. Act before you think. We see this happening every day in the lives of those around us. We all know people like Fernando, and most of us at one time or another have been that person. It is easy to become so focused on accumulating a certain amount of money or possessions that we have blinders on. The thought of stewardship is seldom considered. In fact, thoughts of others as anything more than a means to an end are rare. But it is possible to move yourself out of this group mentality. I've seen it happen. Once a person changes his mindset to a stewardship philosophy, it changes everything. It changes how that person thinks, serves, communicates, and produces. The rich life then comes into play full bore. This is the first step you must take toward building the life you want. Once you appreciate and care for the things you already have, you can then move on to the next step, which is identifying where you are and where you want to go. In order to make the shift out of the scarcity mentality, you get to go against something your mother probably told you. You get to act before you think. I hope your inner child is smiling now. When that paycheck arrives, act overjoyed. Don't think about the credit card debt, the unpaid bills, or the swimming lessons your daughter needs. Look at the check in your hands and appreciate what it is before all the other negative thoughts come rolling in. Use what you have and be grateful for every little thing it can do for you. Then, apply this to every area of your life. Let's take a look at those areas now. Human Assets Energy For most people, the word energy applies to how we feel. There is a lack of it around midday when our eyes start to droop. Driving home from work, we have a sense of being totally drained or tapped, not quite sure why, as an adult, we're always in such a deficit when children seem to have more of it than they can ever use up. There is another way to look at energy. As with money, it is also an inside job. There is the physical aspect with which we are so familiar, but there is also a larger force at work, the thoughts we think. That's right. Our thoughts are full of energy. Even before we act on them, they affect our physical being. You are either creating positive or negative energy through and by your thought patterns. Believe it or not, it comes down to science. The study of quantum physics has determined that at a subatomic level, an atom is either a particle or a wave. These waves are invisible, and we know them as energy. Everything in the universe, including our thoughts, begins with energy in one form or another, and according to the scientific study and observation of these atoms, matter, particles, and energy, waves, are attracted to that which is of a like vibration. This means you attract what you put your energy and focus on, consciously or unconsciously, whether wanted or not. This is the basic precept of the law of attraction. It has been proven scientifically that thoughts are energy that can actually be measured. So take a moment to ask yourself, how do you measure up with respect to being a steward of your thought energy? Are you allowing negative thoughts to have free reign? Do you have fear, anger, resentment, jealousy, and bitterness that often occupy your mind? If so, it can be a prime example of poor stewardship and a massive drain on your energy. Most people don't even realize how negative they are. In fact, over half of most people's thinking tends to lean toward the negative and fear-based. It's surprising how much more energy will become available to you once you become aware of this inner drain. The late Dr. Masaru Emoto is a scientist most known for his study and photography of water. Given that 71% of the Earth's surface and three-fourths of our bodies are made up of water, Dr. Emoto conducted groundbreaking research documented in his book, 
The Hidden Messages in Water The study provides stunning conclusions about the effect of our thoughts on physical reality. The doctor's work was visually presented in the documentary film, What the Bleep Do We Know? Maybe some of you remember the scene where they set up glasses of water to visually record the effects of negative energy. Participants in the study were asked to approach these glasses of water and direct specific thoughts at them. After a designated period of time, profound results were visually available and put on public display. When my friend Claire saw the film, she was impacted most by the visual difference between the two extremes, the glass of water that received hateful words, accusations, judgment, and blame, was literally black and murky. The water glass that received positive encouragement and gratitude remained crystal clear and on a molecular level was beautiful to look at. Claire realized then she'd gotten into some negative habits of blaming and complaining, and inspired by the film, she decided to conduct a study of her own. She would go for one full month without complaining. She marked the days out on her calendar and kept a journal to take note of any physical changes she felt. Near the end of the month, I asked her how things were going, and with a wry grin she confessed, I have to be very quiet. Claire went on to explain, Every time I get together with my girlfriends, we talk about our husbands or boyfriends and we complain. I know that sounds terrible. We don't do it in a malicious way. We just commiserate. Talking would dissipate my negative feelings, and afterward I would feel better. I think it did help at first, but then I noticed it was becoming a pattern we had fallen into. We would bring up old stories or expect things to go the way they had gone in the past, and we weren't letting the energy go. We were keeping it alive by talking about it over and over again, the same old things. I would talk to my friends, and then afterward I would be all churned up about something that had happened a long time ago. Sometimes I would even be anxious about things that might happen, things that weren't real at all. It affected the way I thought about and behaved around my boyfriend. So, I decided to keep my mouth shut. My girlfriends and I went through an awkward period because basically I had to retrain my brain. But the relationship between my boyfriend and I actually improved. It was two weeks after that conversation my friend Claire announced her engagement. Thoughts of complaint and blame require a huge amount of mental energy, and in the end, nothing good ever comes from them. Problems solved in this way are temporary bandages, harsh words aimed at someone else in order to boost our own self-image. Most complaints are not intended to solve problems. They are not even directed at the people with whom the problems occurred. When Claire realized her complaints to her girlfriends were not only misdirected, but also a drain on her energy, she stopped doing it. She found that a better use of her energy was to become more proactive. She began looking for things that were right instead of wrong and discussed any concerns with her boyfriend first. Doing that helped them both move forward, and she became an example to her girlfriends. In fact, despite their awkward period, even those relationships deepened as they became drawn to her positive energy. Now, retraining your brain might not sound like a fun thing to do, but I guarantee you it will produce surprising results. All the anger, bitterness, and resentment that you feel you have a right to hold on to is harming only you. Not only does that rob a person of physical energy, it contributes to a wide variety of illnesses as well. It creates and releases more and more negative energy that in turn attracts more negative people, unhelpful events, and lack of assets. Worrying actually helps to create the very things you are trying to avoid. In the case of Claire and her girlfriends, their discussions perpetuated strong negative feelings about the men in their lives that prevented those relationships from growing. In terms of our finances, this is how poverty 
and scarcity thinking keeps people in a continual pattern of lack and insufficiency. Even if at first you can't change those negative thoughts, just becoming aware is a huge step toward becoming a good steward of your energy. Time We human beings have gone to great lengths to invent machines and systems designed to save us time. As a society, time equals money is a mantra we all believe in. But what, exactly, have we done with all the time we have supposedly been saving? Tasks are often dragged out and expanded to fill a certain time slot. This is as true for the hourly wage employee as it is for the entrepreneur as it is for the retiree. It is especially true for directionless individuals who have not yet discovered their life purpose. Their days are filled with tasks that have nothing to do with the purpose and calling of their life. Because these tasks are often energy draining, efficient use of time is not possible. We will spend a great deal of time talking about life purpose in the next chapter, but as it applies to stewardship, a good rule of thumb to apply here involves becoming aware of your own authentic response to offers that will require your time. Jack Canfield, author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, explains it this way. When you are presented with an opportunity to do something, say someone has invited you to be an officer of your favorite civic club, if that opportunity doesn't excite you so much that it causes you to say, hell yes, then by default, the answer for you is most likely a hell no. Even though this is said tongue-in-cheek, the guarding of our precious energy is something that needs to be looked at. Time is finite. There is only so much of it in any given day. A directionless person will say yes to most anything and everything. The focused person, on the other hand, is well able to say no because they are able to prioritize. You will find that you are either spending your time moving toward or away from your purpose. This does not mean that you are involved in bad pastimes or wrong activities, but rather it means that you are involved in things that are not helpful. These things are at the expense of investing in what is best for you and your life purpose. If time is given away randomly, with no direction or purpose, you won't have any left to invest in the things and areas most important to you. It helps to remember that we are all given the same number of hours in every day. What you do with those hours will become more and more clear to you as you further develop your plan for achieving a rich life. Life Your life purpose is rooted in the gifting and talents that have been endowed to you. We will spend the next chapter on life purpose, how to identify it, and how to invest in it. But for now, one of the most basic ways to learn your life's purpose is to ask this question. If you could spend your days doing what you love, regardless of whether or not you received monetary compensation, what would that thing be? The answer to that will most likely reveal valid clues toward what you were put here on this earth to do. Once you have identified your life purpose, put it to the question we brought up earlier with regard to stewardship. Do you view your talents and physical possessions as something you own and are entitled to, or as special gifts that have been entrusted to your keeping? When you view your life as a gift to the world, it makes sense to take steps to ensure it. Later on in the book, we will talk about the importance of taking good care of your body. We hear advice over and over again from doctors, surgeon generals, and mothers, but you're going to hear it from a financial planner. If you have been prioritizing money above taking care of yourself, it's time to set the order straight. We are talking about your assets, and because you are the most valuable asset you've got, you come first. When it comes to finances, you are your most important asset, not the stacks of printed paper. You are the one with the ability to earn. Life insurance is something most often sold to us out of a fear-based mentality. We buy it because we are afraid of what will happen if we don't. For those of you who have resisted the idea of life insurance for this reason, or for those who feel they can't afford it, I offer a new way of looking at it. Insure your life for its full value, the same way you would a home or car. Doing so 
shows good stewardship of your most valuable asset, you and your earning potential. It is easy to believe that you can't afford it, but this way of thinking buys into the scarcity mentality and the idea that money is more important than the people it was created to serve. Purchasing life insurance also demonstrates good stewardship for the people most important to us, our family and loved ones. One of the most touching stories I ever heard came from a woman named Lynn who called into the radio station during one of my talk shows. You could hear the tears in her voice as she told me about her husband, Arthur, who had died a few years ago. I didn't know anything about what insurance policies he had taken out, but after he died, the life insurance he bought allowed me to pay off the mortgage. That was so important to me. This was so important because I live on a fixed income. He gave me peace of mind, she explained. It takes most of us our entire lives to realize that peace of mind is an asset. You don't have to wait that long. You can realize it right now. Relationships My grandma used to say, birds of a feather flock together, and it's true. We do emulate those with whom we spend time. It might be time to ask yourself why you spend time with the people you do. Often we spend more time at work than with our family and friends because we have convinced ourselves that the goal of accumulating money is more important. I've seen it time and time again how that goal leads to a hollow and unfulfilled life. The business first mentality or the end justifies the means results in an erosion of our most important relationships both friends and family. And it does nothing to build a healthy environment among the people we work with. Relationships are so important, I'm going to spend an entire chapter on it later in the book. But for now, with regard to stewardship, ask yourself the following. What kind of steward are you to the people closest to you? Are you investing in carefully building those relationships? Outside of family, do you spend time with those who bring out the best in you, those who encourage you and challenge you? Are your group of friends made up of people who scoff at your dreams and visions? If so, you may want to consider finding a new group of friends. In a later chapter, we'll take a new and different look at how to build your team of professionals. Imagine surrounding yourself with like-minded professionals, such as financial planners, accountants, attorneys, life insurance agents, trainers, and coaches. In other words, begin looking for individuals who are living their life purpose, mission-driven professionals, who are passionate about what they do. They will value as the customer above the transaction, and in so doing, will offer you a higher quality of service. But it goes beyond that. Aligning yourself with these types of individuals will also help you move toward your rich life. My experience with mission-driven individuals began shortly after the night I met Richard and began to redefine my idea of rich. It happened almost organically. When I began telling others my story, I saw that there were already people out there who took great joy in their work because they were really helping people. And they were some of the highest paid, most respected professionals in their field. As I began talking with them, I heard their stories, learned the how and why of what they do, and as a result, I became influenced by them in a positive way. Many even went so far as to give me a hand up. These are the people you want to look for as you begin to build your rich life team. There are hundreds of financial advisors in my area who can help you set up an IRA, but a mission-driven advisor is really invested in the client and adding value to their life. These are the kind of professionals you want to make it a point to do business with. How we treat the people who are closest to us affects our peace of mind. So, too, do the interactions we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. If we make it a point to be kind to everyone we meet and to patronize those businesses that do us the greatest service, we are showing good stewardship toward human life. In turn, we will receive more of it for ourselves more energy, more self-worth, 
and peace of mind. And nothing helps fuel our life purpose more, helping us to be more productive or creative, than peace of mind. Physical Assets Stuff I have a friend who travels for her work, and so she spends a lot of time in airports. Julie is of slight build and so is often approached by others offering to help carry her bags. She always politely refuses. I believe a person should pack no more than they can carry on their own. That's my rule and I keep by it. That allows me to come and go as I please without having to wait around for anyone to help me. That's especially important if you're a woman traveling alone, she explains. We all have a certain amount of physical possessions some more than others. While it's important to care for and be responsible for what we have, it's also important not to place an inordinate amount of emphasis on physical possessions. As the old saying goes, it's better to own our possessions and not have our possessions own us. Too much value placed on possessions is a one-way street to disappointment and lack of fulfillment. If you ask a person at the end of his life, if he wished he'd purchased one more boat or a bigger house, that's not usually at the top of the list. Stewardship in this respect has as much to do with priorities as what we do with what we have. A lot of people don't consider caring for their things a priority. They either don't have the time to perform the maintenance work and so just keep buying new, or they simply don't care. This second could be due to a lack of energy, Sometimes we really don't have the time to keep up with maintenance issues at home, or we really did pack too much stuff. We then have two options. Either hire someone to help us, or downsize to something we can handle on our own. A colleague of mine has a son who is learning piano. His teacher, an accomplished musician in her own right, told him that, as a general rule, when playing a piece of music, you must never play the piece faster than you can play the most challenging part. In other words, the difficult section of the song dictates the tempo of the entire piece, because that difficult part must be managed securely. This is a good analogy to apply with possessions. You want to be sure that they do not own you, and that they do not take up too much of your energy and time. As a rule, Take on no more than you can comfortably manage in the pace of your day-to-day -day life. If you have to slow down for one challenging part, say for example, taking care of a house that is bigger than you need, then the entire song of your life will suffer the consequences. Financial Assets Money The very item that most would consider to be first in the list of being a good steward actually comes last. So often I see individuals who justify spending all their time at the office because they are climbing the corporate ladder. They feel that by earning more money, they are taking care of their family. The end result amounts to dollars accumulated in the bank and with a deficient family life. The miserable multimillionaire I mentioned at the beginning of this book is a prime example of why money must not come first. He had alienated his family to such an extreme that none of his children were speaking to him by the time I showed up to help manage his fortune. He was also on his third marriage. I later found out from his lawyer, however, that she had just served him his divorce papers. Sudden Wealth Syndrome Most people have bought into the equation that the world is selling. Money equals happiness. It's simply not true. We have erroneously given pieces of paper a weight and value higher than that of the people it was meant to serve. If money were all it took to become happy, we wouldn't have the malady known among professional counselors as sudden wealth syndrome. The money finally appeared, but then in most cases, the happiness disappeared. Sports stars, entertainers, and lottery winners are notorious for making a great deal of money in a short period of time and squandering it quickly. They start spending it on things that only go down in value – mansions, yachts, cars, jewelry, and partying – and start to disperse the remaining money on things that have no personal value. They can usually keep this up until they stop earning the big money 
or in the case of a lottery winner, until they run out of capital. I could give dozens of examples here, but let's just take a quick look at one. Former NBA star Latrell Sprewell. Sprewell purchased a 5,200-square-foot, 70-year-old mansion with six bedrooms and four fireplaces. He purchased it as a home, though he was hardly in it, and eventually couldn't keep up with the expense of a $920,000 loan. Because Sprewell failed to make the monthly mortgage payments, he lost first the $1.5 million yacht and finally the mansion. Both purchases, good examples of poor stewardship. There are many statistics that show how sudden wealth syndrome affects various people in various ways. Many of them end up saying they wish they had never won the money in the first place. And they are dead serious when they say that. Context of money. Good or bad? Some people get stuck in financial ruts because of a belief they hold, much of the time an unconscious belief, that money is bad. To want it, to have too much of it, even to pursue it is considered wrong. We've all heard the expression, money is the root of all evil. Well, this is another myth I would like to help dispel. And here is another secret. Money by itself is neither good nor bad. Money by itself is neutral. It is what you do with that money that becomes either good or bad, right or wrong. The context in which the money is used has nothing at all to do with the money itself and everything to do with the person using it. Think of the people who are closest to you. Picture them standing with you on the shore of a wide moving river. On the other side of that river is a picturesque island with houses and trees. On the shore behind you is a raging forest fire. Now people are running and jumping into the water. It is pandemonium all around, but you spot a man at the marina selling rafts for a thousand bucks. If you buy a raft, you can put your family on it and get them safely across the river. Many people are trying to swim, but the current is too strong and they do not fare well. You have a thousand dollars in your pocket, and as the flames roar behind you, you think, what a great deal. You gladly pay the thousand dollars for your raft. You put your family on it, and off you go towards safety. Once installed on the island, you are so pleased with the performance of this raft that you pick it up and carry it with you everywhere you go. You know it has great value. It was expensive and saved everyone in your family and you will not let it go for anything in the world. It is very heavy, and you work hard to keep the raft safe. You strain and you sweat. Some days you really become stressed about it. Meanwhile, a drought comes. The river bank becomes muddy and the water unsafe to drink. Drinking water becomes scarce and very expensive, and those close to you start to become sick. A group of men offer you bottles of water in exchange for ferrying their cargo across the river. They have a dark look to them, and you are suspicious of their intentions. You discover their cargo is not only water, but women and girls, and you realize they are traffickers. But still you ferry them once a week under cover of night, because they pay you water, and besides, these are desperate times. You do this work until your wife finds out. She begs you to sell the raft, but you won't. She refuses to drink the water you bring home and eventually becomes very sick. Still, you won't part with the raft. News comes from downriver that an artesian spring has been discovered, flowing freely from a cliffside. You find out the name of the town, and though it is nearly 300 miles away, you immediately set off, determined to bring back gallons of water for your loved ones. You know you must keep the raft safe and in good repair to hold all the water you will be bringing back. Trouble is, as you make the journey, there are storms and turbulent waters. The raft becomes your entire world. You stop often to make repairs. You work hard to keep it safe. When the town with the spring finally does show up, you float right on past it, busy with your raft. 
the river becomes wider, the current stronger. You cling to your craft, and eventually you become directionless at the whims of the current. When you finally do embark upon shore, you are thousands of miles away from your family, and you have no idea where you are. The raft in this story represents money. Like money, it is a vehicle to help you get from here to there. Its value came from its ability to get you to where you wanted to be. And like money, its value increased depending on the number of people it was serving. On land, it wasn't worth very much. On water, it was worth a fortune. So the question is, was the raft good or bad? The answer is that it was both. Its value depended on how it was being used. The raft was good when it saved your family. It was bad when it caused you stress. It was bad when used to harm others. It was good when it set you on your way to find better resources. And it was bad when you became so focused on it that it distanced you from what you valued most. When we apply this idea to money, we call it context. When thinking of the dollars in the bank or in your pocket, view them in terms of context. Consider those dollars in terms of how they are to be used and how they will help you get to where it is you want to go. View them in terms of the good they can do for others. It is also important to note here that money earned in a way that harms others will in turn only harm yourself. But the converse is also true. Money used in the service of others will only increase and help you to become more prosperous. It all depends on context. The purpose of this book is to help you achieve the richest life possible. And by that, I mean that I want you to have full access to all the assets, human, physical, and financial. You may be surprised by what comes first, you. You may have also noticed what comes last money. That's right. You are the greatest asset you have. In the next chapter, we are going to get to the core of your life purpose. Once you identify that and bring to it the practice of wise stewardship, you are well on your way to receiving one of the highest returns on the best investment there is. Portfolio Builder Being a good steward means taking care of or being a good keeper to what you already have. It is the first essential step toward achieving financial success. And if practiced consistently, good stewardship will bring positive returns on your investment as soon as right away. The takeaways. There are three kinds of assets, human, physical, and financial. It is important to show good stewardship over all your assets, not just money. As it applies to your assets, the secret to attracting more of them in your life is to appreciate what you already have. Act before you think to make the shift out of a scarcity mentality. Make a conscious effort to be grateful for any and all assets currently in your life. Act before you think and appreciate what you already have. Money is neither good nor bad. Money by itself is neutral. The value of money is based on context or how it is used. Action Steps Make a list of all the assets in your life. Write down the things you can begin doing in each of those areas today to demonstrate good stewardship. Perhaps the greatest physical asset we have is the one right under our feet. Make it a point to practice good stewardship toward the planet you live on. When out in the world or even in the office, pick up any litter you see, even if it isn't your own. You can begin doing this right away, indoors or out. When I used to go camping with my dad, he always made us stop and take a look around before we got in the car to go home. He would ask the question, Am I leaving this site better than when I found it? If the answer was yes, then we would go on our way. Being a better steward of our spaces is something you can easily begin doing today. But be sure to make a list of future goals, things you would like to implement down the road, 
and work out a realistic time frame for achieving those goals. Here are a few examples. Stewardship of time. Think about where and how you spend the bulk of your time. Time can be budgeted the same way that money can. Try charting your days for a week or so and see where the time leaks exist. Are your minutes and hours spent on the mundane and meaningless? Or are you investing that time in areas that will result in long-term benefits to you and to the community at large? Stewardship of Stuff Maintenance of your house or car can be time-consuming, but putting it off will only ensure that it will cost you even more in the end. Make a list of the small maintenance tasks you have been putting off and come up with a workable plan to get them done. For example, involve the family in house projects and regular car washing. Schedule time for regular oil changes, maintenance checks, and tune-ups for all the engines you rely on. Don't forget the snowblower. When things need to be repaired, take them in to a professional right away instead of waiting until the problem gets so bad the repair turns into a replacement. Stewardship of Money Good stewardship of money puts the emphasis on context and the person it serves. As it applies to your rich life, you want to invest in yourself first, your life and where you are going. Apply the principle of paying yourself first this discipline teaches you to live on less than you have coming in. A certain amount of every paycheck is set aside and put into savings. I recommend having this deducted automatically if you can. The amount is up to you and will depend on your individual financial situation. It doesn't matter if it's $5 or $5,000. What's important is that you get into the habit of doing it. Other good examples of wise stewardship with money would be to invest in your education to further a career and or to raise your financial IQ, working with mission-driven financial advisors, investing in tools to start your own business, or books to increase your knowledge. Make a list of those investments that can begin to serve you rather than the other way around. Bonus Gift Download your free copy of the Action Guide for the Rich Life, 10 Investments for True Wealth at www.richlifeactionguide.com.